My name is Dan Mitchell. I'm a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, I have the easy part of, uh, of this panel. I just moderate, which basically means that, hey, you know, we have John Tamney and Warren Coates, uh, uh, and, and really they, they need no introduction. John is a former colleague of mine at Cato. He's written the book, is it Who Needs the Fed or Who, uh, yes, Who Needs the Fed? Uh, and he's obviously going to be taking the uh, position in this debate that the Fed is not our friend. Uh, then we have my colleague on the Cayman Financial Review editorial board, Warren Coates, uh, who used to be at the IMF, but I don't hold that against him, at least not too much. Uh, and he's going to be taking uh, the other side of this debate. The rules are pretty simple and clear. John will speak for 10 minutes. Warren will speak for 10 minutes. I'll have my little stopwatch and, uh, and also a taser uh, to try to keep them uh, uh, in line. And then it, they'll each come up and give five minutes of, of uh, rebuttal uh, to what the other had said, uh, and then we're going to have some Q&A, uh, both from me and hopefully from uh, those of you in the audience, uh, and we're going to do a poll at the very end of our discussion as to do you think the Fed is good or bad, for lack of a more sophisticated way of phrasing the question. Uh, but one thing that Mark Skousen asked me to do is he wanted us to have a poll at the beginning. Now, I was uh, hoping to stall a little bit so the audience would flesh out some more, uh, but since we want to get things going, we'll do the poll now, and even if it's not st statistically representative, especially if the crowd grows, uh, raise your hand if you are pro-Fed. Okay, Warren, you have a lot of work ahead of you uh, on, on your uh, side of the equation. Raise your hands if you're anti-Fed. All right, uh, so uh, we're going to have a debate where, Warren, you have no place to go but up. Uh, and, uh, but I, I know Warren is a very capable, uh, uh, knowledgeable person, so he might be able to do that. Uh, but let's go ahead and start right in on the presentations. John, the floor is yours. Uh, and actually, I'll stall for a second because I want to make sure I get the stopwatch going here. The floor is yours in exactly now. Okay, well, uh, first off, major thanks to Mark Skousen for putting this on. What an accomplishment um, for him, and then he's also a very accomplished thinker himself. Um, I always tell him that I don't believe in measuring economic growth that gives politicians too many bad ideas, but if we must, I will take his gross output over the ridiculous number that is GDP. And let me also thank Warren Coates and Dan Mitchell for being up here. I'm very humbled by the people who are sandwiching me right now. And I'm certainly humbled by the audience here. Some, the two people right here that whom I'm staring at, George Gilder and Steve Forbes, have taught me much of what I claim to know. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, now, about my book, Who Needs the Fed, by hundreds of copies. Don't be fooled by the cover or the title. It's actually a very optimistic book that argues that the Fed was never nearly as powerful as is commonly assumed, and even better, market forces are rapidly rendering it less and less relevant by the day, and that, I think, is a positive thing. Uh, now, to explain where I come from on this, I want to first uh, explain what I, how I view credit. Uh, Ludwig von, von Mises described this as he who tries to borrow money needs it solely for procuring other economic goods. That's how I see credit. We do not borrow dollars to stare at them lovingly. We borrow them to access things like trucks, tractors, computers, desks, chairs, most of all labor. We in the real economy produce the resources. The Fed cannot increase or shrink those resources. That's what we create. And so people see the Fed and they see a low uh, Fed funds rate and the media says, well, that means there's easy credit in the real economy. But when you look around you, there's really no such thing as easy credit. Um, Brian Grazer is easily one of the most talented movie producers in the history of the industry. His track record is Splash, Parenthood, A Beautiful Mind, Apollo 13, TV shows like uh, 24 and Arrested Development. But as he freely acknowledges, his attempts to attain credit to fund his ideas fail 90% of the time. Thinking about Silicon Valley, that's seen as a place where credit is very easy, but as evidenced by all the billionaire venture capitalists out there, it's in fact very expensive. If you want to fund your new startup, you will give up a big portion of it to a venture capitalist, and even more in the form of stock options to potential employees. Investment bankers earn princely sums on an annual basis, not because CEOs are generous, but precisely because it's very hard to attain resources to grow your business. 
Many of you are familiar with the great Michael Milken and his capitalistic achievements. They were a function, his fu fortune was a function of the fact that most every business in the United States does not rate attention from a bank. His fortune is a function of the fact that credit is very difficult in the real economy. All of which brings us to Donald Trump, the presumptive GOP nominee. Uh, many of you remember that he reached his height as a real estate mogul in the 80s, but as early as the 90s, he was already viewed as a very major credit risk by banks. And uh, banks to this day in the U.S., I have it on good authority, generally will not touch him as a loan. And so I mention all of this to make two, I think, very, very happy points. The first thing is that only in academia and only among those untouched by economic realities is there such thing as easy credit. In the real world, it's incredibly hard to attain resources to, start to grow a business or anything like it. This is similarly optimistic because it's a reminder that the Fed isn't as powerful as is commonly assumed. If it truly could allocate and decree easy credit, we would be a very poor country, but in fact, we're a very rich one. And so the question then becomes, what purpose does the Fed serve? Now, I argue that the Fed never has served any useful purpose. Um, it began in 1913 with a limited mandate as a lender of last resort to solvent banks. But what we've seen since its inception is that solvent banks never go to the Fed for a loan, at which point it's insolvent banks that go to it, which means the Fed's existence has very much weakened the banking system. I submit that the Fed's been a disaster for the banking system. The Fed's a bank regulator, but we know from 2008 alone that it's a tragically bad regulator. If you work at the Fed, that's usually a sign you couldn't get a job at a bank in the first place, and so the idea that the lesser talents could oversee the great greater talents doesn't make a lot of sense. The Fed sets the rate at which banks loan to one another, but an interest rate is a price like any other. We don't need the Fed to set the interbank borrowing rate. Um, so I say end it because it serves no useful purpose, but um, let's face it, a lot of uh, economic schools would disagree with me. Uh, Keynesians say we need the Fed to increase credit during recessions to prop up the economy. Well, that fails in two important ways. For one, recessions are beautiful. They're the sign of the looming economic boom on the way because recessions clear out all the bad stuff in the economy. Secondly, the Fed has no resources to increase in the first place. It can only misallocate what we've created in the real economy, although I argue that's a shrinking amount. Monetarists have a different point of view. They argue that the Fed should control the money supply and oversee a set increase on an annual basis. Monetarists are calling for a certain form of central planning. Because in the real economy, money supply is never a problem for the productive. As von Mises once said, no individual and no nation need ever fear at any time to have less money than it needs. Beverly Hills never has a money supply problem. The Fed couldn't keep money supply off of the island of Manhattan on its best day or outside of San Francisco or Silicon Valley. But let's imagine if the Fed tried to increase money supply in a poor city like Baltimore to stimulate the economy. Let's imagine that the Fed were to buy bonds from banks to increase loanable funds in Baltimore. <laughs> I submit to you that that would fail between breakfast and lunch, simply because banks can't stay in business lending to those who lack the means to pay it back, so a Fed increase of supply in Baltimore would immediately flow out well outside of Baltimore. Applying it to a country like Greece, um, if it was said that Greece could have been saved with an increase in euros and banks there, but the same idea applies. An increase in euros and Greek banks would have flowed to Germany and other more economically productive countries almost immediately. And so I bring all of this up to make the point that the Fed cannot change the on-the-ground reality. It cannot increase money and the resources money is exchangeable for in places that will not treat it well. In the same way, some argue that the Fed can, in fact, increase economic growth just by existing, by increasing uh, money and credit. People who make that argument are making a Keynesian argument. I think most in here in the room would agree that governments can't spend what they didn't take from us first. Well, the Fed has no private stash of resources over here that it can push into the real economy. It can only misallocate what we've already created. And so the Fed serves no useful purpose, but I have no illusions that Congress is going to end it anytime soon. It's too convenient of a whipping boy for the political class. 
but it doesn't worry me either way. I'm an optimist, and what I see happening is that while the Fed, the Congress will not end the Fed, market forces are doing it for us. Let's not forget that the Fed's channel through which it presumes to influence the U.S. economy is the U.S. banking system. Banks represent 15, 1-5% of total lending in the U.S. economy. That number is in free fall, and it is precisely because technological advances have rendered hyper-regulated banks as a very dated way to allocate the economy's resources. And so with the decline of banks, we're going to see a decline of the Fed as a relevant institution in total. So end the Fed, okay, that would be great, but it's not going to happen. The good news, however, is that market forces are ending the Fed for us. And I'll leave it to bring it to Dan. Uh, he even left a minute and a half on the table. How efficient. Uh, Warren, your turn. Okay, since I don't trust your clock, I'm going to start mine as well. <laughs> I said I wouldn't put my thumb on the scale, but go ahead, use your own. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. It's a pleasure to be on the podium with John and, uh, and Dan. Uh, and I thank Mark uh, once again for inviting me to Freedom Fest, which I always enjoy. Um, while, while I think that John and I agree on many of the basics, I disagree with many of his specific statements and propositions in the book. For, uh, the overall summary is he really has no clue what the Federal Reserve or any other central bank do and, and what they're about. Uh, there are three parts to the book, credit, banking, and the Fed. Uh, given the strict time limit that Dan is monitoring over there, I'm going to skip the first two, credit and, and banking. Uh, maybe it'll come up in discussion and, and go right to the third section on, uh, on the Fed. Uh, but just a note on the credit section, J John uh, continually and throughout confuses and mixes money and credit. Uh, and this colors a lot of what he, what he says. Uh, on, on the Fed, most central banks these days have the legal mandate to regulate the supply of their currencies so as to keep its value stable. This is the so-called price stability mandate. Uh, in the case of the Fed, it has a prob problematic dual mandate, maximizing employment and stabilizing prices, and I won't have anything else to say about that. Uh, there are several basic approaches to fulfilling this price stability mandate, <clears throat> ranging from fixing the price of the dollar to gold at one end of the, the spectrum, the gold standard, uh, to targeting inflation uh, with market determined, in other words, freely floating exchange rates at the other end of a, a long spectrum of policy options. The policy debate is or should be about which of the rules for managing the money supply would be best for the United States. So I'm not here to, to defend the Fed. I'm highly critical of uh, the policies they've been following of late uh, and many of the policies they followed in the, ba in the past. Uh, but that's not the, the, the serious issue. John acknowledged that you know, it's going to be around. So really, the proper question is, what, what are the policy rules, the policy regime, that should guide the behavior of the Fed? Uh, John says that Milton Friedman, I'm, I'm quoting, uh, was the modern father of monetarism, a theory of money that says the central bank should closely regulate its supply. Uh, Friedman said no such thing. Monetarism says that like every other good, the value of money is determined by its supply and demand. The demand for money comes from the public and has been empirically uh, closely related, not perfectly, but uh, on average closely related with their income. As income grows, demand for money tends to grow. The supply is determined by the central bank in accordance with the policy rules that it has adopted. The supply, uh, the, the gold standard was one such rule, a fixed monetary growth rate rule once advocated by Friedman is another. Inflation targeting now in vogue in many central banks around the country is, is yet another. John makes a number of statements that suggest that he understands none of this. He says that production is the source of money. Uh, we can make, I'm, I'm, uh, that's a quote, uh, we can make sense out of this strange statement if we change it to say that production is the source of the demand for money. Uh, 
given, that, given that demand, monetarism says that the price or value of money, its purchasing power, will be determined by its supply, given that demand. And its supply will depend on the policy rules that the central bank follows. If the Fed creates more money than the public wants to hold, people will spend the extra money. But as John and I agree, spending such money does not create uh, the goods people want to buy. Thus, a money supply that exceeds its demand will drive up the prices of goods and services, and that is the monetarist story of inflation. John goes on to say that, quote, Friedman viewed inflation solely as a money supply phenomenon. Inflation was a function of too much money as opposed to a decline in the value of money. <clears throat> uh, I can't make sense of this strange statement. The statement that, quote, inflation was a function of too much money is a statement about the cause of inflation. It's true or false. Uh, the final clause of John's statement says that, quote, inflation was a function of a decline in the value of money, close quotes. I'm not making this up. Uh, but inflation is a decline in the value of money by definition. So what does John mean? His effort to explain why these are different seems to concern the allocation of money around the country. He says, one, quote, and as he told us earlier, money migrates to where production is, end quote. Yes, it goes to where it's demanded. John confesses, uh, I'm sorry, John confuses the market's role in allocating credit around the country with the Fed's role in controlling the aggregate quantity of money. It is shocking that someone who writes regularly on this subject fails to understand its basics. I cannot find any evidence that John understands anything about the basics of monetary theory, money, and, uh, money supply, money demand, and its price and its value. Another indicator of John's confusion comes from the first part of his book, uh, actually, uh, yes, first part of his book, when he compares the Fed's lowering the Fed funds rate to Nixon fixing gasoline prices below the market level. Fixing gasoline prices lower than the market price reduces its supply and increases its demand and produces long lines at gas stations in the hopes of tanking up before the station runs out. But the Fed does not fix the Fed funds rate. It sets a target for it. The difference is profound. The Fed funds rate is determined by the market, in the market by banks. When the Fed reduces its target for the Fed funds rate, whether it's a good thing to do or a bad thing to do is a separate question, but when it uh, sets its target for the Fed funds rate, it increases its supply of liquidity to banks to, uh, so that supply and demand for, in the market force interbank rates down. So this is the opposite of the gas price thing. If the Fed is tar targeting a lower rate, it, supplies, it increases the supply of liquidity in order to get the rate to come down because it's working through markets. It is not setting the rate. Uh, John repeats his fundamental misunderstanding throughout the book. In order to emphasize the importance of the distinction between fixing the Fed's run rate, Fed funds rate and targeting it, let me in Donald Trump fashion repeat the point. The Fed does not fix the funds rate. It enters the market as a buyer or a seller of treasury bills in order to increase or decrease the supply of bank reserves in order to stimulate the market to move the rate to whatever the, the, the Fed's target is. John repeatedly describes the folly of the Fed trying to increase the money supply in Baltimore or Cincinnati to stimulate growth there as markets will attract it away to healthier areas that demand it. Uh, he repeatedly discusses money as if it were credit the Fed does not, uh, um, the Fed does almost no lending and then only if banks tem are temporarily in short supply. When the Fed wants to lower the Fed funds rate, it buys treasury bills from the market. The transactions, so-called open market transactions, 
take place in New York, but the sellers of these Treasury bills to the Fed are scattered all over the country, and the newly created money is deposited in the seller's bank accounts all over the country. John fails to reflect basic understanding of how monetary policy works. Uh, John's misunderstanding of how the Fed uh, operations, uh, of how the Fed operations is further illustrated in the following statement, quote, the Federal Reserve proceeded to borrow reserves from the banking system so that it could buy trillions of dollars worth of treasury bills, mortgage-backed securities, et cetera. The Fed has credit to allocate only insofar as it extracts it from the economy, end quote. This is completely and totally wrong. The Fed supplies, the, the central banks really do print and create money. Uh, the Fed supplies reserves to the banking system by buying treasury bills. Oh dear, I, my, my alarm is telling me sooner than, than you did, so this was a mistake on my part. Um, stop. Um, I'll finish up promptly. Yes. Uh, okay, the, Fe the Fed supplied reserves to the banking system by buying treasury bills that it created. Understanding this is absolutely fundamental to an understanding of what central banks do. Um, John and I are both skeptical, and maybe I'll say, save this for the, uh, the, the follow-up, we're both skeptical about the Fed's ability to manage monetary policy uh, so as to smooth out business cycles while maintaining a stable, stable value of the dollar. We both think that keeping short-term rates near zero for a long time has been a mistake. In the long run, monetary policy determines the price level and the rate of inflation, not full employment and real income. John and I agree that the health of the economy, or its lack thereof, is much more the result of stifling regulations and monetary policy. Now, he says nothing about what he would like the policy regime to be or to replace how the, the Fed behaves. I'll have something to say about that in the, uh, of my view uh, in the follow-up. Okay, five minutes now for John. Well, I guess I'd say um, I wish I'd written the book that uh, Warren said that I wrote, but uh, much of what was said really isn't, wasn't my point. Um, I'll say about the Fed funds rate target, that's, that's basically nitpicking. Uh, furthermore, the Fed does try to influence the rate at which banks lend to one another, but my main point there is that the Fed's over here trying to create or, or make credit easy, but as I point out in the real economy, we operate as though the Fed doesn't exist, and I think that's a very positive thing. Now, Warren says that the Fed's job is to keep uh, inflation or price level stable or um, I, something like that, but let's in, in, in a real economy, prices are how a market or economy organize itself in the first place. Furthermore, it's not the Fed's job to control the value of the dollar. That's a myth that anyone at the Fed would tell you is not true. That's not their role. That's historically been the U.S. Treasury's job. And if you look throughout the history of the U.S. dollar since the Fed was formed in 1913, the first major devaluation occurred in 1933. This was FDR's decision. It was the first decision he made when he was in the White House. Fed Chairman Eugene Meyer resigned over that decision. The Fed did not agree. In 1971, President Nixon decided to delink the dollar from gold. Uh, Fed Chairman Arthur Burns passionately begged him not to do just that. And it's a reminder that even if we did not have a central bank, there would still be major devaluations. Now, I didn't say in the book that production, uh, I, I, fr I can't remember exactly how Warren phrased it, but I did make the point that where there is production, money is always evident. If that weren't true, then we'd have to believe that Kashgar, in the, in the, uh, which is on the border in China of Afghanistan, just lost the money supply lottery to Shanghai. My point is where there's production, there's always going to be money, and you don't need the Fed for that. I didn't come up with a solution, a monetary solution, because I'm kind of a free market guy. My take is that even if we got rid of the Fed tomorrow, if we, even if the Treasury stopped issuing dollars, there would still be money 
supply abundant in the world simply because money is what the productive use to facilitate the exchange of what they produce and it's also the way of facilitating investment. My strong sense is that if we got rid of the Fed and, and the U.S. Treasury tomorrow, Treasury's role in overseeing the value of the dollar is what would happen is Amex, J.P. Morgan, all sorts of market sources would come up with money that's far more stable and that wouldn't be persistently be devalued by the U.S. Treasury. But the point is the Fed does not control uh, the value of the dollar. That's something that, that that's a popular thing to believe, but it's 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 just not true. Uh, Warren says that the Fed supplies money to banks in short supply, but that's also not true. As any well-run bank will tell you, it's unheard of to go to the Fed for a loan. To do so is an admission of bankruptcy, and that's one of the reasons that I think we should get rid of the Fed. The Fed can only exist as a lender of last resort to failed banks, and those are the ones you want to die so that the banking system overall can be strengthened. But the main thing about my book is I'm not making a big statement about what monetary policy should be. Um, I don't presume to know what it should be. Um, that would be a big error. What I'm saying is that this notion that the Fed controls credit or has a major role in it is defied by market realities. I think that's a very good thing. In terms of where we go from here, my perfect world, I'm, I guess I'm a bit of an anarchist. I believe that if we did not have government in control of money, that private market sources would do a much better job. As for what the Fed can do, the other reason I think we can get rid of it is because the Fed quite simply cannot push money and, and, and the resources that, attract, that it, it, it's exchanged for into an economy that does not rate it. The Fed could not increase the economic chances of Baltimore or West Virginia on its best day. In much the same way, if the Fed tried to shrink the supply of money in a locale like Silicon Valley, it would similarly fail between breakfast and lunch. Warren exists in a world in which there's just the Fed. But we know that the, 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 the two-thirds of all dollars in the world are around the world. They're not, they're not, the Fed doesn't control most of the money supply or the money out there in the first place. And so the idea that the Fed can have some major control over, over, the, over the flow of credit is defied by common sense. If the Fed tried to shrink Silicon Valley today, global sources of capital would fill, would fill in almost instantaneously in much the same way if it tried to, to add it in poor parts of the, of the U.S., that money would flow out instantaneously. Resources are never attracted. Warren, your five minutes. Uh, John continues to confuse money and credit. The Fed has no role in allocating credit in the economy. Its job is to control the money supply. It, it, it's novel, the idea that he thinks it controls the money supply in Baltimore or in San Francisco or some other city. It controls the aggregate supply of dollars in the world, and markets allocate where, where those go. There is uh, a confusion that many people make. It's not necessarily a confusion, but uh, different people sometimes mean different things about the value of money. Uh, some people think of the value of money in terms of its value relative to other currencies. That would be the exchange rate, uh, and the U.S. has not fixed, the, the Fed or the Treasury have not attempted to fix the exchange rate since 1971 when the gold window was closed. Uh, so virtually, well, so central banks uh, that are not pegged to gold or some other currency have as their mandate for preserving the value of currency, not in terms of the exchange rate, but in terms of purchasing power. The CPI, you know, what can you, what does your dollar buy here? So different people sometimes mean one or, or the other, and it's always helpful to, to, to clarify. Uh, let, let me, um, if, if time permits, there are a number of important fundamental ways and areas in which John and I do agree, uh, one being that the Fed certainly can't uh, print resources into being. Uh, economists call this neutrality of money. In the long run, uh, money has uh, no relation or impact to real values. John, throughout the book, rarely distinguishes between real and nominal values. Uh, but everyone uh, that I've ever heard of up until now 
has always acknowledged that the value of money, purchasing power of, of goods and services, is uh, either tightly or loosely ultimately uh, determined by its supply, just like any other good in the economy, supply and, and demand. Uh, e even uh, you know, Krugman, Krugman would acknowledge that you can't have serious inflation without a central bank printing a lot of money. Uh, you know, but, so I'm a little bit surprised. Let, let me quickly wind up with uh, what I would propose as a monetary policy regime. And I would imagine John might uh, be sympathetic to, to these views. Uh, I would favor a supply of money determined by market demand whose value is fixed to a basket of goods. Now, that could be the gold standard if the basket of goods consists of a, a specific amount of gold combined with issuing or redeeming money by currency board rules. Now, I, that, you know, th that's how a strict gold standard would work. We never had a strict gold standard, and the lack of strictness is what sort of allowed uh, Johnson and, and Nixon to veer away from proper fiscal discipline necessary to be consistent with the gold standard. Uh, and then they, had, then they ga gave up the, the gold standard. But I would prefer a very strict uh, currency board rule so that the market, not the central bank, the Fed or any other central bank, has anything to do with determining the supply of money. It would be strictly uh, market determined. And I suppose I could end there. I've written, by, by the way, I, I do have comments on his other sections, and I will post them on my website this afternoon so anyone interested can, can get a copy there. Oh, very good. You both kept under your time. Uh, for the rest of our time, we're going to do Q&A. If you have a question, come up to the microphone, make it a question, make it brief. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and use my role as moderator to ask the first question because I sort of wonder whether or not there's really that much difference between you. Uh, take on the issue of the Fed funds rate. Warren, you say the Fed can't set the Fed funds rate. John says it can. But ultimately, aren't you saying the same thing? Because the Fed certainly, through its operations, can get the Fed funds rate where it wants it to be. So is that really... Uh, do you all really have a difference there in terms of ultimately the Fed wants the Fed fund rate here? It's going to get it there, right? Okay, here's a, one way of explaining the very fundamental difference uh, between uh, how the Fed pursues getting the funds rate it wants and and s setting the funds rate, which is not what it what it does. Uh, if if we had a strategic oil reserve back in 71, and uh, Nixon then fixed gas prices below the market clearing price, but used th the Fed's approach, uh, he would have to do so. He would have to drive, he wouldn't set the rate at a low, the price at a lower pr uh, rate. Uh, in dead, instead, he would release Fun, uh, gasoline from the reserve and increase the supply of gasoline so that the market would lower the rate. That's, what, that's how the Fed influences the Fed funds rate. They vary the amount of liquidity in the economy. Now, they don't always do it in a direction that I think is appropriate or, or sensible, but the technique of doing it is absolutely the opposite of fixing the rate. It is using the market by augmenting or diminishing the supply of liquidity, using the market then to uh, clear at whatever supply and demand dictates under those circumstances. It's the opposite of what John was saying. Well, I, I don't think Warren knows what I was saying, so it's, it's, it's somewhat hard to comment, but we've got to get back to, to basic logic here. The Fed is trying to influence the borrowing rate between banks that represent 15% of total lending in the U.S. economy. So you think this little box here influences the lending of all these other much bigger boxes in the global economy? I don't think that's a credible argument. My problem with this, this debate about the Fed funds rate is who cares? 
Again, with banks, we're talking about the least dynamic source of credit the, world, the U.S. economy has ever seen. Most lending occurs well away from the banking system, and that's the point of my book. This focus on the Fed funds is a, is a waste of all of our time. My point is that the truly, do you think Silicon Valley businesses rely on banks for their startup funds? It's laughable. Most lending occurs well away from these banks. And so while the Fed is over here trying to influence the economy with, through the, most, the least dynamic source of credit in the U.S. economy, all the real activity is occurring away from it. And that's the, as my point, whether it's a target or whether the Fed can control it in total, the real lending, the real capital flows occur in the economy as though the Fed doesn't exist. This focus on the Fed funds rate is, is so backwards as to, as to it's, not, it's a waste of our time. Our, to the extent that financial markets are reasonably efficient, then the wide range of rates that we see largely reflecting differences in risk of those who are borrowing, uh, and to some lesser extent, the source of funds available to them, uh, will all move in lock, lockstep. They're not, uh, they don't operate independently from one another. That's an implication of an efficient market, and I think our markets are reasonably, reasonably efficient. So if the Fed is pushing down on the Fed's funds rate, and I'm not defending that policy, I'm, I'm just describing how the real world works. Uh, it, it does have an impact on rates across the spectrum. Uh, look at mortgage rates in the last uh, six, seven years. They're giving mortgage money away. That's a long-term loan uh, from the market. It has nothing to do directly with the Fed, but that low rate is very much influenced by the fact that the Fed is keeping short-term borrowing rates overnight uh, borrowing rates near, near zero. Now, I think that's been bad policy, but, but it's, uh, it, it's definitely a, a, an influence of what the Fed is doing. If the Fed, uh, the, the, as I said, the, the way the Fed would push the rate down is by pumping more liquidity into the market. This means uh, traditionally we can get into the paying interest on excess reserves that they've gotten into, which changes how all this works. We can get into that if anyone wants. But uh, uh, traditionally, uh, it, it, it would mean an increase in the, in the uh, growth rate of the money supply. But they're the opposite sides of the same coin. If you push down interest rates by pumping more liquidity in, you're causing the money supply to grow more rapidly. Now, the neutrality of money, and this is a, an issue John and I agree on, uh, says that in the long run, if you're pumping money in, uh, rather than lowering rates, you actually raise them because the money that you're pumping in ultimately raises prices, causes inflation, and that inflation and the expectation of further inflation raises rates. So an interest rate is, you know, the, the, the market idea of a, of uh, equilibrium or market clearing real rate plus their expectation of inflation over the horizon of the loan. So uh, I think we're all agreed that the Fed can't create real resources. It, it can't keep interest rates uh, down below equilibrium levels uh, forever or for a long time. And if it tries, it ultimately makes them even higher. Let me ask uh, John, uh, ask you a question. You say that the Fed is, in some sense, inconsequential. But most free market people would say the Fed can be very consequential. Most, many free market people would say the Fed played a big role in causing the 2008 financial crisis. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, I would disagree. I think if we don't bail out Bear Stearns, there is no financial. The financial crisis had nothing to do with finance. It was a, it was a political concept whereby the bailout of Bayer created an assumption in the marketplace that other institutions were going to be saved. Hence, Lehman, which shouldn't have been a big deal, was a very big deal. As Ron Krieger pointed out earlier, when Drexel died long ago, when Solomon died, they weren't huge market events. The difference this time was, was that the government meddled. 
Uh, now, there, there's this belief, of course, that the Fed caused this slow growth rush into housing consumption in the first place, but I always like to quote George's 1981 book, Wealth and Poverty. I can almost paraphrase it. As he wrote in the book, and this was when the Fed was actively jacking up rates throughout the 70s, he wrote about housing. He said what happened was that citizens speculated on their homes. Not only did, did there, and, and his point was, is that housing prices were soaring despite the fact that the Fed was jacking up rates substantially. The notion that the Fed is the driver of so much activity, the notion that the Fed interacting with banks that are such a yesterday source of credit is so consequential defies common sense. Most commerce in the U.S. has nothing to do with the banks. That's why Michael Milken was so successful. Do you think that Hollywood, do you think that Silicon Valley is relying on banks? Banks are yesterday, yet that's the Fed's, that's the Fed's channel to influence the economy. So I think we vastly overstate it. And that's why I bring up all these examples about Milken, Hollywood, um, Donald Trump. In the real world, okay, the Fed allegedly increases money supply and loanable funds, but it really can't. Market forces always dictate where credit flows. I agree uh, with a great deal of what John just said, but let's distinguish the uh, financial crisis that he ties to uh, Lehman Brothers, et cetera, and I, I agree with his analysis there. Let's, let's distinguish that from the housing bubble and the collapse of the housing bubble, which preceded this a bit, uh, but was integrally in, involved with it, and I think the Fed uh, has much more blame, not total, because there is public policy, the uh, uh, pressure to extend loans to people of questionable creditworthiness and so on, which was not the Fed's doing, that was uh, Congress's doing. It, 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 it's, a, it's a more complicated story. Steve. Um, just a couple of quick questions uh, on, uh, can, one, can the Federal Reserve control the money supply, and if you could address why Volcker in the 19, late 70s did try to uh, control money supply, it manifestly did not work. Then in recent years, as you know, the Fed has vastly increased uh, bank reserves, uh, twice the rate, three times the rate of the 1970s. In the 70s, we had an explosion in the CPI. Uh, today, we haven't had it. And uh, finally, why is the amount of bonds as a total credit in the U.S. gone in recent years from 39 percent of credit to 53 percent of credit, and why we haven't had this money supply explosion that we had in the 70s? That's a, that's a great question, because Paul Krugman is always saying to free market people, uh, you guys predicted uh, you know, an explosion of inflation with the Fed's uh, policies. Why hasn't it happened? Warren, John, either one of you want to take a shot? Well, let me um, try first. Uh, the, the Fed most definitely controls the money supply in any central bank around the world. Uh, the control is, is not uh, always particularly tight. In, in Volcker's period, he most certainly reined in the growth in the money supply. Uh, the consequence was a pretty harsh recession as we brought inflation down from 11, 12 percent down to normal, normal levels. It might have been done in another way, but the Fed certainly most definitely controlled uh, what was happening to the money supply. He deliberately reduced the rate at which it was growing. Uh, the, the current situation is, for the United States uniquely, uh, complicated by a new instrument the Fed never used before, uh, which is to pay interest on excess reserves. So the vast increase in the Fed's balance sheet uh, went into remunerated excess reserves that banks were happy to keep there rather than to lend out, so the money supply did not grow. Base money grew rapidly, but other uh, M1, uh, M2, 3, and so on uh, only are now growing at their normal rate, which is five to five to six percent or so. And I think uh, a major component, a major factor there uh, 
Are the regulatory burdens on banks that lower the return from lending, so they need higher rates than otherwise to compensate? You know, there are a lot of non-monetary things that are discouraging banks from lending, but as John keeps repeating, uh, the fact that the total credit in the economy uh, is only, what did you say, one-seventh or something from banks, uh, doesn't mean that the one-seventh uh, part is unimportant if you believe that markets are, are at all efficient. And I think markets are reasonably efficient. So even though it's a small part, it's a part that, that uh, arbitrages with, with the entire market. In the late 70s, before Volcker did his crunch in 81 and 82, he did try the monetarist experiment. Friedman yep. uh, praised him in 1979. Why did the 79-81 experiment in monetarism fail? It didn't fail. It brought the inflation rate down no, from... No, you're, you're confused. 81 and 82, Volcker mm -hmm. went on a savage deflation to kill inflation once and for all. Mm -hmm. In 79 and 80, he did try to Friedman's praise to try to control the money supply. Instead, we got double-digit inflation. We had the huge boom. Then we had the uh, recession in the first quarter of 80. It didn't work, and he finally said, we're going to try something traditional, different, we're just going to smash the economy, kill the inflation. But he did try Friedman's idea of monetarism in 79 and 80. Why didn't it work? Why couldn't he control the money supply? Well, I what I, I emphasize those are two distinct periods, yes. 79, 80, 81, 82. I was at the Fed at that time when Volcker came. He was president of the New York Fed and implemented Friedman's monetary rule he didn't implement Friedman's monetary rule, but he, he shifted attention from the Fed funds rate, and it was unborrowed reserves that the Fed paid a lot of attention to, to the money supply itself. Uh, bearing in mind the empirical evidence that Friedman reminds us, or used to remind us of all the time, that the impact of uh, monetary change is one to two years in the future. So you have to take account of the lags in these things Volcker's uh, tightening down on the growth of the money supply, which was Friedman's uh, approach, worked. It brought inflation down, but it, it, it was perhaps too harshly done, too quickly done, and therefore the recession might have been larger than it needed to be, et cetera. Uh, but th I don't think there's anyone who imagines that you can turn a sharp corner of years and years and years of in increasingly rapid monetary growth and suddenly put on the brakes, as Volcker did, uh, following Friedman's approach, uh, and, and, and brought that rate down. You know, I, I don't think anyone imagines you can do that uh, painlessly, and it wasn't, I, well, wasn't wait, painless. Uh, um, wait a second. The monetary-based 70s and 80s grew the same amount. There's this, there's this myth that it grew enormously in the 1970s, but in fact it didn't. If Volcker's attempt to control the money supply worked, why then did the price of gold, which would be one of the more sensitive measures of the value of the dollar, soar to 875 in 1980? And so my argument to all of this is that, in fact, Volcker's role in the crushing of inflation is vastly overstated. Notice how what happened in, in February of 1980. Ronald Reagan wins the New Hampshire primary, and suddenly the price of gold started to fall. Reagan ran, of course, at that time on returning to some form of a gold standard. Markets invariably do not price in the present, they price in the future. It became apparent to the markets before the polls that Reagan was going to be the next president, and the dollar strengthened quite a bit. There's also this myth, the dollar is far more of a political concept. Warren keeps talking about how the Fed can control the value of the dollar and, and inflation. Implicit there is that if we got rid of the Fed, we would never have devaluations again. But as we've seen throughout history, most of the major dollar devaluations did not come from the Fed. This notion of supply being the driver of a currency's value makes sense, but contrary to what Warren says it does. Sweden or Switzerland or Switzerland has the 93rd largest population in the world, yet the Swiss franc is the fifth most loaned currency in the world. It's heavily in supply. Why is it so strong and stable? Because that is the policy from Switzerland to pursue a stable franc. 
if, if President Obama tomorrow were to say, okay, I've de decreed that the Treasury should pursue a dollar that's one one thousandth of an ounce of gold, and that will be its price going forward, watch as the supply of dollars go globally skyrockets. There would be no inflation. Stable currencies are the ones that people, the producers want to have, and they do simply because producers aren't producing for money that's not exchangeable for other things. They're producing for money that is exchangeable. So what we find throughout history is that the best, most stable currencies are heavily in supply, whereas the weakest ones aren't very much supplied at all. So I think we vastly overrate Volcker's role in the killing of inflation. I think Ronald Reagan's election as president was a much bigger deal because what we find throughout history is that presidents get the dollar they want. Let's not forget the Fed did not want the 1933 devaluation. The Fed was passionately against the 1971 devaluation. The dollar is a treasury function. As anyone at the Fed can tell you, the Fed's job is not to control the dollar's exchange rate. If they were to comment on them, that would be them getting in the way of the Treasury's function. Actually, before we continue, uh, what time is this panel supposed to end? 9.50. 950. <laughs> okay. We, we, we've already gone five minutes over. Do you have a really, really quick question? Uh, but let me give a quick, quick reply uh, to this. Very, okay. Very, uh, very quick. Uh, I, I agree with John that expectations play a very important role in market interest rates, market uh, uh, valuations, et cetera. So the combination, but expectations you know, are formed only when changes seem credible. The election of Reagan was an important change in market confidence, et cetera, that policy would be uh, more restrained in the future than it had been in the past, et cetera. But that's a combination of reducing the rate at which the money supply was growing. I also agree with right, second, but Friedman, and we can find this in Secrets of the Temple, Milton Friedman was very clear in the 1980s okay, that well, as, well, after well, Reagan was elected and the dollar, supply of dollars soared, he said this is an inflationary okay, we're, 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 we're already, event. We're already five minutes over time. What's your quick question? Uh, I'm Ford Fisher from the Tax Revolution Institute. Very quickly, my question is, uh, if the printing of dollars yields inflation, would you think of inflation essentially as a tax on savings or having cash. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, inflation is by definition a tax. I just think you overrate the printing aspect. QE, I don't know which bankers Warren was talking to. Bankers I talked to said that QE had nothing to do with money printing. It was to your point about the uh, Fed was borrowing reserves from banks that had no, nothing to lend to in the real economy. That's the reason they were leaving reserves at the, at the Fed for 25 basis points, because there were no credible lending opportunities in the real economy. There was no money printing, but I submit to you that in a stable dollar environment, you could not print dollars fast enough to make up global demand for what would be a credible okay. currency. All right. uh, on that note, let's do our post-debate poll. And we didn't really debate, do we like the Fed or not like the Fed? So it's kind of a strange you know, question. Uh, but I, I guess we'll just do it. If you think John won the debate, raise your hand. If you think Warren won the debate, raise your hand. Well, you sort of got more votes than the first time, but we asked completely different <laughs> questions, so there's frankly no lesson that we can learn from that, but hopefully you all learned some lessons from our debaters. Uh, please thank them. Thank you very much.